All right, hello everybody. Hope you enjoyed your lunch. Doop -doo. Yeah, I don't like eating my lunch fast, to be honest, but you know, needs must and all that. Okay, so today is the uh, deadline for the Excel spreadsheet. Does anyone have any questions about that spreadsheet or what needs to be done? So email is fine. There's not a, a place on Blackboard where you can deposit it. So just send it to me by email. Um, yeah, here we go. Well, go on to caps. Please remember to put your name in the file name of the file. Makes my life a lot easier then I don't have to <coughs> rename it myself. Yes, that's correct, Adam. So uh, essentially for a step-by-step -step kind of run through, oops, I'm not sharing my screen. Oh, the snoring dog on the couch next to me. Uh, this video will, or Dr. Page will take you through all of it. However, you do need to have, uh, where's the chat gone? So Excel spreadsheet equals graph of the data. Now you can you can graph it whichever way you prefer. It could be like Dr. Page, could be like the different ways I showed last lab. As long as you have, you have axis, axis titles, uh, clear key, looks nice, cool's great. That's pretty much it. So again, there are different ways of graphing the same set of data, depending on what it is you want to say about the data, right? So think about what it is you're trying to say with that graph, and that will dictate how you draw it, like what categories of data you group together. You know, if you're gonna be doing it by <clears throat> sex and phenotype combination, you'll have eight categories. You're going to have it by sex, by phenotype combination and observed versus expected, and you're going to have 16. You know, so it varies just like what you're trying to say, how you want to say it. Also, you need your chi square analysis and odds ratio and uh, basically map distance and center organs between the two genes. Uh, 
basically everything that you're going to be putting in the results section of your mini lab report. Correct. Yes, Adam. All of that uh, comes from the data. Yeah, well, you should have, um, but I can't tell him. Wait, do that video again. You missed out something. So the reason I want uh, I want you to put the odds ratio in the Excel spreadsheet. And I'll, I'll send this out as an announcement as well afterwards, just so everybody kind of is on the same page, even if they're not like here right now. Uh, just write that down. So it's graph, chi-square, odds ratio, uh, what else? centimorgans yeah so the reason why i want you to do that this time is because many students forget to put that in their mini lab report and so if you forget to put the odds ratio pardon me in your mini lab report you lose 10 percent just like that and that would suck because it's not a complicated thing to work out <clears throat> and because the results section is so important uh, both you know in general for manuscripts and, and reports but also for this one in terms of your grade all of what you're doing for the excel spreadsheet tonight gets picked up and plonked into your lab report the only thing in addition to what you're doing today for the results section is adding a bit of text in your lab report describing what your results are so really from today, you'll have almost all of what you need for half of your lab report. So you're kind of getting it done ahead of time, essentially. You'll just reuse the same stuff over. Okay, so I think that might have answered some of your questions. Are there others? Because now's the time to ask. Can we find the odds ratio on maybe like a site or um, on how to do it on Excel? It's, uh, I'm not sure how you do in Excel. It's a fairly straightforward calculation. If you just scroll down into the fly linkage report, there's a really good, which you can see me coming up to really good description of how to calculate the odds ratio right and so essentially what you're doing is uh, looking at the two different loci the white locus and the yellow locus and for the white locus you can have either a recessive or normal allele for the yellow locus you can either have a recessive or normal allele too Right, and so you take the data from up here. Here we go. So I'd add the data together for the sexes just because that increases the power essentially. So first add together. the sexes right then you fill out, oops, out a uh, table right and so that table is basically going to be okay for the <clears throat> white eyes and yellow body com combination right so that has 
the W allele and the Y allele, you'll have these two uh, data sets combined together, like a thousand or so, right? So that you put in here, right? Because that would be your white eyed yellow bodied flies. Do the same for the wild type eye, red eyed, wild type body, brown bodies, add those together. And then you put that into this cell here, because that's going to be plus and plus. That's a contingency table. There you go. That's what it's called. And then for the other two squares, you put in the uh, white. So that would be the W allele and the for eye color, and then the plus allele for body color, right? So that would be 10. And then in the other box, it's going to be plus for the eye and uh, recessive allele for the body color. That would be 11. Right, so recessive allele for body color, that'll be that, and plus 11 will go here, and then 10 will go there. And then you simply follow this equation. So you add uh, those two times together, right, divided by those two times together. That's your odds ratio. Essentially, if you have the whole point of this is starts from the premise that if you have equal odds of any of these combinations occurring, you should get a value of about one. <clears throat> so if these uh, two loci were acting independently on different chromosomes or not linked or whatever, if they're acting independently, you'd expect equal numbers of the offspring. Right, so you'd have a one to one to one to one ratio of the four different phenotype combinations. And so basically, then you'd have, you know, say 500 times 500 divided by 500 times 500, which would be about one, depending on, you know, the exact numbers. So if you have a number larger than that, what you is basically saying is that you're that times more likely to find a Y with a W and a plus with a plus than you are to find them not like in the opposite, essentially. So that's all the odds ratio is. It's really just a way of calculating the kind of the odds, literally, of finding a particular combination of alleles together. And in the case of linkage, you always do the odds of finding the alleles together in a parental combination versus the recombinant or non-parental combination. And if they're independent, then you should find an equal number of all of them. If they're not, you should find an excess of parentals. And this tells you how much more likely you are to find those alleles in the parental combinations than the new recombinant combinations. Does that make sense, Adam? Uh, yeah, it's just I'm not used to reading a contingency table like that, so I'm trying to piece it all together. No, that's all right. I mean, it's. I've never used an odds ratio in anything that I've ever done, to be honest, because I just don't do that kind of work. But uh, essentially, it's uh, if you look at a fine, it's, really, it's the probability, in a sense, or well, right, odds is probably a better word, of getting these different combinations together. So this is kind of like a Punnett square, in a sense, right? But we're not looking at combining. Uh, you know, two heterozygotes or something together, we're looking at seeing how frequently we find different alleles together. And so <clears throat> Y and W together is your 
double mutant parent plus and plus together is your double wild type parent and then w and plus and y and plus are the recombinants because they're the result of recombination between y and w and so if there was no linkage between y and w you'd expect the same number roughly of all of those four different combinations I mean, another way of doing it, you don't even have to use a contingency table. You can just follow this equation, really, where um, if you kind of add to it, <clears throat> you basically have number of parental one times number of parental two right those are kind of just another way of looking at it divided by number recombinant one times <clears throat> two All right that's just another way of looking at it so if it helps put it in the table, and it does for some people, do that. Uh, if it helps not even a little bit, don't. Just follow this uh, equation, and that'll, that'll get you exactly the same answer. So you don't really need the table. You just kind of want the equation with the value at the end. Mm -hmm. okay. So the table is useful because it forces you to look at the phenotype combinations, right? And so. One thing I'm always want to make sure you're cautious about is not leaping to conclusions, right? And so this forces you to think, okay, what are the parental allele combinations? Well, we know from the cross design, which is further up in this document, it's going to be, uh, we're going to have a <coughs> wild type chrom chromosome plus plus, and we're going to have a recessive chromosome YW. And so this just, in a way, it kind of forces you to slow down and think through what you're doing as a, you know, a slow and steady approach. But as long as you understand it, no, you don't need to do that. You can just put it into this equation and you'll get exactly the same result. Yeah. But I am actually kind of, I am quite a fan of, you know, just taking stuff slow and steady because you can make assumptions which aren't always supported. So no, Galen, you don't have to put the table in there, but I do need to see an odds ratio. And so I'd suggest in the um, Excel spreadsheet, you actually show your working as well. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. Um, I was also wondering um, what you just wrote in your Word um will that update for us yeah i'll make myself another note <laughs> okay yep All actually right. i need to upload the um that powerpoint too okay cool then yeah that that's all i had a question about thank you awesome no worries thank you for the reminder um so Adam, parentals one and two. No, that's this isn't like the chi-squared test. This is simply the observed data. From the table. So this isn't based on any assumption whatsoever. We're not taking into account what we think might be happening. We're simply calculating the odds of getting particular alleles together and so if you think about what linkage actually means linkage means that you're more likely to find one if you have a 
dominant Y allele, you're more likely to have a dominant uh, W allele at the same time and vice versa. If those two genes are linked, if you have a recessive Y allele, you're more likely to have a recessive W allele than a wild type W allele because those alleles travel together, they're linked. And so really the odds ratio is just a way of calculating what are the odds of getting dominant and dominant together or uh, recessive and recessive together versus getting a different combination. And that's what the odds ratio is about. Ah, okay. So, uh, hang on, it's probably easiest to show you. Okay, so if we go up here, parental one, oops, would be wild type and wild type. So that would be red eye, uh, wild type, yellow body, uh, brown body, sorry. Parental two would be, uh, come on, mutant and mutant, which would be white eyed yellow body. Recombinant one, doesn't hurt to type these out to be honest, would be let's say, well type eyes, mutant body. Recombinant two, would be, what would that be? White eyed, wild type, uh, brown body. So essentially it's these four combinations here, right? So if you have two genes, each with two alleles, you have four different possible phenotype combinations. You have either the combination you see in one parent, so that's this parent, wild type, wild type. Combination of alleles you see in the other parent, do, all right, which is this one, which is the recessive male. That gives you two chromosomes, either wild type, wild type, or recessive, recessive. And so if no recombination occurs between those two, you'll get only red-eyed, brown-bodied, flies and white-eyed yellow-bodied flies. If there is some recombination, you'll see some of these, which are the recombinants, one and two. If there is always recombination, either these are on different genes or they're so far apart on the X chromosome, that recombination always occurs between them, you would expect an equal number of all four. So a one to one to one to one ratio. And so if you times one by one and divide it by one times one, you'll get one. And so an odds ratio of one is basically all different combinations, all of these four are equally possible or equally likely based on the data. If you have an excess of parentals, in other words, linkage is occurring, recombination doesn't always occur between these two genes. They are genetically linked. If that is the case, then you would expect an odds ratio of greater than one. Now there's not really a way of saying, oh, it has to be greater than X amount and it's uh, important. It's just a straightforward number, a basic, what are your chances? And so if you, and again, don't calculate all of this using these examples because they're not the data that you'll be using. 
the data you're using is the tape in the table uh, further up these data right that's what you want to use so don't copy these things across because it's not going to work right and so basically what this is saying is that if you look at 24,597 individuals one of those time if you look at the that many times one of those times or thereabouts you're likely to find a different combination of alleles than what was in the parent the rest of the time 24 and a half thousand times you're likely to find instead a parental combination so either wild type wild type or mutant mutant and that's a pretty big difference again there's no statistical uh judgment that goes with that it's kind of a basically a mathematical observation but it's a useful one it's just another piece of information that you can add to your story did that help Did that clear things up, Adam? Cool, that's good. Okay, anybody have any other questions about this assignment for tonight? I think I answered everybody's that was in the chat. The link for what, Adam? It's by email only. Yeah. And Galen, yes, just the, the spreadsheet. And I'll send an announcement uh, once we're done here, just as a reminder of what needs to be in it. And in many ways, that's more of a benefit for the people that aren't in lab that want to submit stuff than the ones that are here, because obviously you get to hear me say it. But it doesn't hurt nonetheless. Okay. So what we can do for the... I don't know, however long it takes, is just talk through the oh, <laughs> lab report. We'll get to that in a sec. Um, yes, that's correct, Adam. <laughs> it shouldn't take you too long, hopefully. Maybe an hour at most. Uh, I will be around this afternoon doing that on the couch, most likely. Probably puppy sitting, stop and complaining about stuff. Uh, so if you do have any questions between now and, I don't know, probably around dinner time, I kind of clock out after dinner, um, give me a shout and I'll be able to clarify stuff for you too. And again, if anyone has issues with, you know, submitting stuff on time, uh, cats eating their internet cable, you know, stuff like that, uh, just let me know. I'm not particularly like strict about stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to start grading these at like 12.01 a.m. Uh, tonight. I'm going to be probably asleep. So uh, not to encourage tardiness, right? Because it's always good to have deadlines to make yourself get off your butt and do stuff. But if you do have issues, don't panic too much. Um, we'll, we'll get this in. I just don't want things piling up is the is the reason for that because if i left it all to the end it would just all be overwhelming okay so in terms of mini lab report again the the ethos here is not is 
to teach you what's in a formal lab report, right? So this is really uh, to kind of show you what you need to put in there. Uh, to if you haven't done one already, to introduce you to the style, right? And this style, as I've mentioned before, isn't just a genetics lab or even a biology degree thing. This is how we talk about our work to the scientific community. So if I, unless you publish in like Nature, which isn't very common, uh, in which case you write it in a different format because they're particular about stuff. Um, but by and large, this is how you talk about your work, right? So one always has to assume that the person reading your work doesn't know all everything that you know, right? And A, they don't might not have the background, and B, they don't know what your question is, right? What is it that you're asking? Like, why are you doing this work? Why should they care, right? And so that's really what the introduction is all about. You want to ask a question, you want to tell someone, probably, you know, might be the whole wide world that wants to read it, might be your professor, why you did this work, right? What was the question that you need to have? Hang on. This is something that I need to put in here. Here you go, something else to add to it to upload. Right, what's your hypothesis? If your work is hypothesis driven, right? Which is always a good thing to do. So that's the introduction, right? And so if you think about it, okay, the hypothesis bit's kind of at the end, right? You know, but to get to that point, you have to educate your reader enough so they understand what your hypothesis is about. Right, because otherwise it's not going to mean anything, right? It's going to be meaningless. Ha! Huh. Hey, you know what's funny? A little bit of a sidetrack. I don't know if anybody else has got the answer to this. You know how we say disgruntled? I'm really disgruntled about my service or disgruntled about, you know, students not putting their names in their file names, stuff like that. Has every, anybody ever used gruntled? I'm really gruntled with my dinner today. No, isn't that weird? I feel like I should start doing that. I was really gruntled with my holiday. <laughs> anyway, sorry, that was a bit of a sidetrack, but uh, it's, a, it's obviously something that's on my mind. No, isn't it weird? I mean, language like follows rules apart from English, obviously. Um, and so, I don't know, I just thought it was kind of something to ask about. So once you got the whole introduction done, which is really a bit of background, a uh, bit on linkage, you know, independent assortment, stuff like that, uh, brief description of the two traits, what is your hypothesis, right? And a hypothesis is not a prediction. I hypothesize that. Actually, that's worth writing down. I hypothesize that. Oops, there's an E there. What's your statement about what you think is going on? Could be that the genes aren't linked. Could be the genes are linked, right? Doesn't really matter, right? Make a hypothesis. That will generate your predictions. You don't have to put the predictions in the introduction. That will come later. But you need to put your hypothesis in the introduction. Then uh, brief methods. Don't need to spend a whole bunch of time on this because obviously the methods are, you know, right in front of me, but you need to include essentially anything that you're talking about in the results. You need to mention how you got that in your methods, right? So if there's something, oh, I don't know, let's say, e.g. chi-square test in the results, You need to describe how you did it. It did 
it in the methods. Because otherwise, it's like, well, how did you get this? Right? <laughs> He's called Lil Sebastian. <laughs> So you are disgruntled then. You are lacking gruntles. I don't know. Is gruntle a thing? Who knows? That's a question for another day, I guess. So your methods needs to have a little bit about each bit. How you did the, the cross, how you did your statistical analyses of the data, right? Anything you talk about in your results, you should describe how you did it in the methods. Right, that's that's the general rule of thumb. Now the results really is easy because you've already done it all. So results section equal all of the stuff from the Excel spreadsheet plus a brief narrative. And that basically means, what did you find? So no interpretation or discussion of the results in the results section. So I don't want to see any, uh, I think these genes are linked. No, that is discussion, right? Or conclusion, whatever you want to call it, right? Results is just a description of what you found. I found, ah, oh, is that true? Where did you find that, Valeria? That's really neat. See, this is why you tell you stuff. Cool. So I'm not completely bonkers then. That's always nice to know. I shall use that word more often. It's clearly an underutilized word in the English language. I wonder what the equivalent of that in Spanish is. I don't know how you'd say disgruntled in Spanish. Ah, anyway, that's for another day, I guess. Right, so uh, um, if you're calculating a, a number, like in chi-squared, you can write down the equation that you used. You don't have to show your work because it's assumed that you used that calculation as you wrote it with the data that you have presented, right? So you don't need to show, like kind of show your work in a sense, um, but you do need to write down the equation that you use to calculate that answer in the results section. So for example, you just, basically this part here, or actually that. So that would be the equation for your chi-squared test. This would, oh, hang on. This would be the equation for the odds ratio, for example. And so the, the idea there is that if someone wanted to check your work, all they would have to do is to take the numbers from your results, use the equation as you described it in your methods, and they should get exactly the same answer as you did using the same data and the same methods. That's, that's basically the idea behind it. And so each one of these points in the results is worth 10% of your mini lab report grade. So the results together make up 50% of your mini lab report grade. And I really do just go through and, and 
Uh, yes, Valeria, that's right. I go through and see if you've got them. If you've got your car squared test presented, right? All of these parts, right? Because a chi squared test is not useful with only two out of three. You get ten percent. If there's an odds ratio there, you get ten percent. Genetic distance, ten percent. Right. So you don't have to do much to get that, but it does have to be there. And then essentially you sum it up by the discussion of the results, right? What do you think happened? Did, was your hypothesis supported? Why do you think it was not supported or it was supported, right? What does that mean overall, right? That's what should be in your discussion. So quite often when I kind of go through and give feedback on rough drafts, I'll often find like the discussion is like that long, but the results has all of the discussion in it, right? So it's really like you've wrote, written everything, you just hadn't written in the right places. Take all that discussion out and put it in the discussion. And there's your discussion basically, right? There's not much more to it than that. Obviously for a paper or a manuscript there is, um, but it's the same general idea. Okay, what was your original hypothesis? Was your hypothesis supported? Why was it or why was it not supported? And that's it. I'm super pleased to find gruntled is a word now. I'm not sure anybody would understand me if I did use it, but even so. So another thing too is that this is due next Tuesday. Pardon me. Yeah, Tuesday, sixth of July is due by email midnight Tuesday, sixth of July. And I'm sorry that that coincides with an exam. Originally it was designed so it was due uh, this Thursday. Uh, but I figured that wasn't actually enough time to get people feedback for their rough drafts. So that's why I kicked it out to next Tuesday. But then the downside is that that interferes with an exam. So we'll see. We'll, if people need more time, then we can extend the deadline. It's not, it's not super critical, but we'll just see how it goes. Uh, so if you want feedback, and I strongly recommend getting feedback, it's a very straightforward way of getting a really good grade uh, on your lab report. Get a rough draft to me by oh, Friday. Because, you know, I have 4th of July too. And I will be spending at least part of it not working and eating food that's bad for me and probably drinking as well. Oh, a little bit, obviously, because I'm a responsible adult. Um, so that will give me time to go through them. Uh, basically, what I do is I compare them to the... Uh, where do I have that? Doobie doobie doo. Come on. There we go. And this is in Blackboard too. Let's move that back over here. Right, so basically I compare them to this. Right, so have you fulfilled the criteria of the introduction, background, brief description of linkage of the phenotypes or the genes, traits, whatever, and hypothesis? If yes, get 15%. Have you described all the methods that you're gonna use in your results? If yes, you get 10%, right? So it's, I don't go into huge detail and kind of how beautifully you write. Uh, although I will give you feedback if you're writing run on sentences or uh, if your organization is kind of difficult to penetrate, things like that. 
but I'll let you know if you've got everything here that you're going to get graded by, right? And then most likely there'll be stuff missing. Sometimes there isn't. Sometimes people turn in a really good rough draft, um, in which case they don't have much to do before they hand it in for, for good. But if you get me that in enough time for me to get it back to you, so you can make changes by next Tuesday midnight, it will almost certainly, I pretty much guarantee that it'll improve your grade. I mean, obviously, I'm not the one writing the lab report, so it's kind of up to you whether you take my advice or not. But if you do, then uh, it's perfectly possible to get 100% for this assignment. And if you do, that's a quarter of your lab grade. That's what a uh, quarter of your lab grade will be 6% of your course grade. So that's over half a grade for your overall course grade. This is something that really makes sense to do well. And it's not hard to do it well. Anybody got any questions? Again, as always, if you've got questions, ask. I do try and get back to, don't always succeed getting back by the same day. It kind of depends on what other stuff's going on uh, at the same time. But I will be very quick to get back to you because I know that you have a deadline in a week's time. And get me your rough drafts. Really, really, truly. It's just, it amazes me. Every time I teach this course, I have maybe a quarter if that of my students submit a rough draft for feedback. And I'll typically have a quarter of my class who get A's for their uh, lab report. There's a pretty strong correlation between the two. Cool. If no one's got any more questions, I'm going to uh, make myself a cup of coffee. So I'll get all this uh, stuff my uh, notes uploaded i'll upload the new stuff i'll send the announcements out about the spreadsheet just to make sure everybody's clear what's expected uh, and i'll get all of the materials from today up i usually aim to get it up by six i'm usually fairly good at that it just takes me a little bit while to kind of trundle through it but all that stuff will be up and that's pretty much it from me so uh, it's Tuesday today, so I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> I'll have to think about that. All right. Take care, everybody. See you soon. <laughs> yes, I am very gruntled. <laughs>